Welcome to Unit 7, Communication Skills. So here's our introduction. Communication is a two-way process. You need both a sender and a receiver. Information can be sent orally, in writing, or through body language. The thing that we need to know is that communication in healthcare is vitally important. Communication between staff members must be effective to provide patients with the safest and best care. Four things are required. We need to have a sender, a clear message, receiver, and then feedback. All are equally important. So the channel is the medium through which the message is sent. Verbal communication uses spoken or written words or symbols. Nonverbal communication is a message sent through the use of one's body. So if you walk into your patient's room and they're rubbing their belly and they have a facial grimace, that is obviously nonverbal communication. So nonverbal communication, um, the message is remembered more for the receiver's interpretation of the sender's facial expressions, gestures, and overall body language rather than for words. Eye contact communicates interest, concern, warmth, trust, and feelings of credibility, which is a big deal. You really want to be credible. You want to develop that trust with your patient, and eye contact is really important. So working with interpreters. Um, an interpreter uh, is a communication professional who mediates between speakers of different languages. Some use sign language. Then we also have a medical interpreter, which is a skilled, qualified professional who understands medical terminology. Now, many of you may be bilingual, which is a huge plus. Um, you will need to be approved through whatever facility you work uh, with um, to interpret for medical procedures and consents. But it's a great thing to do and they actually pay you more money hourly if, um, if you have the ability to help them in that way. So this is kind of interesting. If your message is 7% words and 38% tone of voice and 55% body language. And so that's how we communicate. But 55% body language really speaks volumes for how we gesture, how we look at our, our patients, and just how we communicate in general. So um, in Unit 2, you learned that each healthcare facility has a line of authority and communication. I'm not actually sure if you guys have covered Unit 2 yet, but you will. Um, we have what's called an organi organizational chart um, at most facilities, and it's a guide for communication. It spells out the line of authority. I remember when I started working at University Hospital and everybody talked about the org chart. I had no idea what they were talking about, but it was something that actually um, was very important and I got a good understanding of a little bit after I had started working there so we'll get in we'll get into that a little bit so the organiz organizational chart illustrates how a department relates to other departments larger departments have their own charts with lines of authority within the departments so an example is nursing or HR you have human resources professional resources environmental services that's usually uh, you know the ones that people that come in and clean the rooms, there's dietary, transport, radiology, so many different departments, many different organi organizational charts within the facility. So here's an example of an org chart with the nursing department. So at the top you have the director of nursing, assistant director of nursing, house supervisor, you guys can see how this kind of falls into play, um, staff nurses, and then out, under staff nurses we have, there, there we are, the nursing assistants, unit secretaries, and patient care technicians. Even though that we're at the bottom of the chart, we're some of the most important people on the unit, and you guys will see that um, as you start your clinicals. So oral reports are used frequently to communicate information about patients. When first on duty, you listen to shift report and hand off at the end of the shift. 
you want to make sure you always give a good report. It's really important. You'll, you guys will see uh, maybe a little bit in your clinicals that someone that gives it a good thorough report, it makes your day a lot easier and it's safer for your patient. Now this report is going to differ greatly based upon the facility you work at. If you're in a long-term care facility and you have 20 patients, it's not going to be quite as detailed as maybe if you're working in the ICU and you're taking care of five or six or seven patients. So the important thing is to convey that important information. What happened on the previous shift? Was there a fall? Um, is the patient going to surgery? Are they not supposed to be eating anything? Are they NPO? Um, so we'll talk more about giving shift throughout the course, uh, giving shift report, but it is very important. So oral communications, nurse who worked the previous shift will report to the oncoming staff. The supervising nurse then gives additional information based on shift report. This again varies depending on the facility you're working at, how they give um, oncoming and outgoing shift reports. Answering the telephone. So many telephone calls come into healthcare facilities. Yes, the phone rings. I off the hook. Nurse aides are not allowed to do the following. This is very important. They're not allowed to take physician's orders. They're not allowed to take results of diagnostic tests or give out any information to families. They must call a nurse. Um, this can be challenging. Uh, a physician calls and says, um, oh, CNA Judy, would you just let Nurse Tammy know that her patient cannot eat anything, she's going to go to surgery. That's actually a verbal order that has to be taken by the nurse. So that's how some of those things can be a little bit confusing and where you might think that you be, may be able to just relay that message. It's actually a verbal order from a physician to a nurse that needs to happen. And the other uh, big thing is um, a patient's rights to their privacy. So even though you know the patient, you think you know the family, if they call for information, you can't you can't give out any information regarding a patient's medical condition. For one reason is that there's the privacy issue, but there's also the other reason that you're the CNA and not the nurse, that the nurse should actually be giving that information about how the patient is doing medically. So what you can do, obviously, um, is identify the nursing unit, identify yourself and your position, ask who's calling, and ask the caller to wait while locating the person called. If the person called is unavailable, take a good message or ask them to call back later. In many situations, we must rely on written communications, and that ability to accurately read communication is essential to patient care. So memos are a brief communication that allows or reminds employees of the following, changes of policies or procedures, upcoming meetings or staff department programs, admissions of new patients, promotions of staff members. M really important, we must stay current in healthcare. There's constant changes and memos are just one way that they can get new information out to you. Maybe they've changed a protocol or a practice and that's something that uh, is our responsibility to keep up with. So they also provide important information, as I just stated. Be sure to know where they're posted. Ensures awareness of facility activities and inf information. Popular places are always the bathroom and the staff lounge. So manuals are located in all facilities. They provide information about policies and procedures. Uh, also, most facilities now have um, everything located on the intranet. So you can pull up a policy procedure, the personnel handbook, uh, but if it's not online, then it'll be somewhere on the unit. So some things you may see, employee personnel handbook, safety and disaster manual, procedure manual, nursing policy manual, and the MSDS, which you'll hear more about, but that's the material safety data sheet. Maybe other manuals for infection control and QA. So staff development is a process used to educate staff from all departments. Classes may inform staff of the following, so there may be new rules and regulations, new procedures, like I was talking about before, recent health findings from research, and how to use new, equi use new equipment. If you're working in an acute care facility, things change all the time. There's always a new exciting piece of equipment, and we all have to be competent on them, meaning that we all need to learn how to use it 
appropriately. Um, so there's usually an educator that comes around and provides that education. Or you may need to just read up on it um, or attend a class. So the patient care plan, the interdisciplinary health care team develops an individ individualized care plan for each patient. In Unit 8, we're going to learn more information on the patient care plan, but you'll hear a lot about it. It's, uh, it's used all the time. It's very important. The patient's medical chart. So each patient has a medical chart or a record. It contains documentation. There's information entered into the chart. The chart is a legal document. Um, in Unit 8, we'll learn instructions for documenting on patients' charts. Mostly, we're, we're really, most facilities have moved to electronic charting, which is really nice. Uh, it greatly contributes to the nursing process. Uh, it's great for time management, and it's really safer for our patients. Other methods of communication, there's modern technology has increased opportunities for communication, computers at nurses' station and throughout the facility. Anymore, there's usually a computer located in every patient's room, at least in the acute care setting. It makes it really nice because when you provide care in the patient's room, you can document real time, meaning you're charting on your patient in that room. So maybe you've just emptied 300 cc's from their catheter bag from their Foley catheter and you can chart that right there while you're in the room. Um, it's, it's really nice. So communicating with patients. A skill in communicating with patients will develop with experience. You may be very uncomfortable at first depending on your background and experience. Your last clinical will be, will be much more comfortable obviously than your first clinical. Um, this is just something that comes with time, but I'm sure that you will develop those skills. Um, active listening is really important. It's a special skill required more than just being physically present, but really being there with your patient. A good thing to do that shows your patient that you are listening to them is paraphrase what they've said, sort of restate what they've told you. Um, it really reinforces the fact that you are listening to them and not just sitting there nodding your head. So communicating with patients with special needs. Communication may be impaired because the patient may be hearing impaired. So one thing that we can do is reduce outside distractions. Many of our patients are hearing impaired. Vision impaired. We always want to let our patient know when we enter the room and when we leave the room and really what we're doing while we're in there. Your patient may have aphasia, which if you don't know this, you'll probably learn more about it. I believe it's Unit 5, medical terminology. But they can have expressive aphasia, which means that they really can't get their words out. They want to they want to convey a message to you. They want to say something to you, but it just comes out jumbled. Or they can't understand what you're saying, receptive aphasia. In any case, you could see where both of those situations can be extremely frustrating for your patients. We need to take our time slow down a little bit and try to communicate effectively. Your patient may be disoriented and they may be from a different culture. So there's lots of different things that we need to consider when we are um, communicating with our patients. I always say put yourself in their shoes. Try to understand what it would be like to be hearing impaired, vision impaired, or not be able to understand what somebody's saying to you. So these patients have special communication needs. They should be addressed in the care plan that we discussed earlier. That concludes Unit 7.